Thanks so much for joining us here at the Loma Linda University Church. We've been talking about it for several weeks now. Well, it's tomorrow, that's Vacation Bible School. Now for you dads out there, remember between four and six, there's some special stuff for you. And then the Vacation Bible School goes from six to 8.30. That's tomorrow right here at the sanctuary. Also today, we're starting a brand new sermon series on the Book of Psalms. It's entitled, More Than Words. The Psalms are more than words on paper. They are songs full of emotion. Through them, God speaks not only to our heads, but also to our hearts. And then Vespers this evening at 5 p.m. is the special film presentation, The Wandering Day. Now this is a documentary about a very unique time in our history around the 30s where our country was considering changing the days which had huge implications on religious liberty. This is a very powerful story, kind of a forgotten story. We encourage you to come out this evening at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. And then finally, we mentioned it last week, I want to remind you again that we are on Roku. The Loma Linda University Church is on the Roku box. You say, well, what is the Roku box? It's basically a little device that allows you to watch anything off the internet on your television. So for those of you that have to huddle around your computer to watch our worship services, this little box, you can connect wired or wirelessly, and you can watch our worship services live, or you can watch anyone that you've missed as well. Also, we're gonna be starting to put some new material that's unique to the Roku, so we really encourage you to go out and get one of these. Now, there are several models, and you can get them online, or you can go to places like Best Buy. There's several models, all of them will work. So we really encourage you to take advantage of this great little box. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, you can check our bulletin, website, the app, or of course, the Uconnect Center in the foyer. With that, on behalf of the entire pastoral staff, have a wonderful Sabbath day. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship at Loma Linda University Church. I am so glad to see all of you here. As I look over the congregation, I am tempted to start calling names and say, you and you and you, but just know I mean you, 
And we're glad all of you, all of you, and of course, our congregation, part of our family, who is with us by television via LLBN and the internet. All of you out there know that you're a part of this worship experience today. And of course, who would, in Southern California, want to miss this? As I looked at the forecast, this is the coolest place to be. So glad you are all here. In the center fold of the bulletin, you see some special people listed. We're going to have some baptisms in just a few minutes. If you know Scott, if you know Celia, if you know Gary, I hope you'll join me in welcoming them as a part of this family. And then there's a little section here called membership transfer. If you know any of those folks who are joining us from other places, please extend your hand and your heart and let them know it is great to be a part of this family. We've got transfers not only by letter, but there's a transfer indicated by profession of faith here. And if you know Lester, please welcome him. And then at the bottom, and I kind of lose a little enthusiasm there because those are folks who have chosen to worship with others in the Sisterhood of Churches. And so I just ask that you will pray a blessing upon those people that the blessing of this place will continue with them wherever they may be. So again, it is so good to be here with all of you today. And I've been through this service once before this morning, and I'm telling you, you are in for a blessing. As we have come to his gates with thanksgiving, may we enter his courts with praise.
Let's pray together. God, this morning we celebrate because in the book of James it says that your mercy triumphs over judgment. And this morning, Lord, we recognize even as a community of faith gathered here to worship you in spirit and truth that we stand condemned and that deep within us resides wickedness, a maliciousness, a sinfulness and evil that is not very becoming of the well put together Sabbath attire that we don these doors with and gather weekly. But we know deep in our hearts that we are in desperate need of your empowering spirit, of your cleansing blood, of your abiding grace and mercy in our lives. And, we, and may this gathering and may this community be marked with thanksgiving and gratitude for all that you have done through Christ. This morning, Lord, we pray and ask that you would put deep within our bellies a hunger for the scriptures, that they would be a guiding wisdom for our community, the ways that we shepherd and parent our children and our families, the way that we lead our lives in the workplace and in broader society and culture as we live uh, for your kingdom and for your cause. Lord Jesus, we want to pray intercessory prayers for those that are not able to be with us, that are sick, that are suffering. We think of bedsides all across this campus and in our hospitals and institutions now that are grieving significant loss, that are dealing with terrible and unfathomable news. And we just ask God that you would be present in our very broken world. And then in its midst, your healing power might be felt and experienced in very tangible ways through our hands, through food we prepare, through the ways that we love on people in small ways to be a reflection of your goodness. God, thank you for our gathered time here together today. We pray for all that are our part, that our hearts might be drawn closer to you, and that as Christ is lifted up, we might glorify and magnify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. For our friends, we want you to know, our visiting friends, that we're on a building program here at Loma Linda University Church. And through the graduation season, we haven't had an update in some time. And so it's about, to, about time that we have an update. I wear this belt simply to remind our friends that we're on a building program. Nobody is building something out back on Sabbath. <laughs> but I get a lot of people asking about the tool belt. And I say, well, it'll get dirty as soon as we start building. And so we have a lot of folks asking, well, what happened to our start date? What happened to our celebration day? And I just want to let you know that it's with a little bit of disappointment and even a little embarrassment that we've had to reschedule that, we postponed that. Now, a lot of folks wondered if something has gone awry in our building program. No, no, we've just had to move that start date down the way. We'll know more about that uh, in, in the months to come. But we're very excited about several things. Several things is that we have the support of this congregation. Friends, the support is just humbling to the pastors. You have 
illustrated the grace of God, the generosity of God, and we just want to say thank you so much. Month after month, we reach a $100,000 goal, and it's amazing. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Folks have asked, why have we, ha why have we had to delay? Well, friends, we had some permits that we were waiting for that just didn't come in. We had some, uh, some bids that just didn't come in like we had planned. And uh, this won't be the, the first time, nor will it be the last time, that we have some news that kind of changes things up. In fact, friends, on this journey, we may, in fact, have discouraging news. Are you prepared for that? We have said before, this is not for the faint of heart. This is for the faithful. And yet I know that it will be built, and it will be built to the glory of God. In fact, the board has recognized that your giving has been so amazing lately that they've noticed that the giving has shifted from the budget to the building. And this puts the board in a, in a unique place, friends. Um, we, we just want to remind you, please don't forget the budget. In your giving, won't you remember the budget? You can see in the bulletin that we're quite a bit down. We have two more weeks before the fiscal year ends at June 30, and we hope that you will be as ever faithful as you have always been. I remember sitting in the pews watching John Ruffcorn in the month of June, or Donovan Krauss in the month of June, and now my dear friend Tim Rawson, he's looking at those numbers and saying, friends, let's remind our good people that we want to end the year in the black. And we'll see how that goes this year. But thank you so much for remembering the budget in your giving, but also your ever faithfulness on the building program. This will take a faithful journey from each and every one of us. Every cent that has come in is accounted for. Every dollar that we collect in the front half is less dollars we'll have to borrow in the back half. Can I get an amen? So I believe that we're on a very good path. And I want to say thank you, thank you so much. For after all, we build for his kingdom.
Good morning, boys and girls. I would like to invite you to come join me up here, right on the steps on either side. Don't be shy. Come on down. I see you running. We are going to have so much fun together today. Go ahead, have a seat. Today, we are going to be talking about music. Yes, music is so important to all of us. I know it's important to you because when I walk up and down the Sabbath school rooms, I can hear you guys singing and shouting at the top of your voices. So I know that you love music. But you know, boys and girls, if you look out here, there are moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas who love music just as much. And I think the reason is, is that it creates so many emotions and feelings inside. When you sing, it can make you happy and joyful so much so that you want to clap and dance. But music can also make you a little sad where you may even shed a tear and cry. So today we're going to talk about music and I thought we could play a game. We are going to play a game called Guess That Tune. Now my good friend Dr. Bali on the piano there, he is going to play a note, maybe a chord, maybe a phrase of the song. And if you know the song, I want you to raise your hand, okay? And let's try and guess that tune. Are you ready? Now the first couple songs we're going to try and guess are about good feelings that we have inside. Okay, Dr. Bali. Oh, do you know that song? I heard it this morning. Happy you know it! Yes, happy and you know it. It does make you happy. It works. Okay, are you ready for another song? Did you forget it? That's okay. Let's see. Do we have another guess? Anybody over here? Down in my heart. Yes, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. That is a great song. Okay, another one. Now, all of you should be raising your hands for that because we sing that from when you are little. And I chose that one for the younger ones. <laughs> yes, Sabbath is a happy day. Yes. Now, songs also, we have songs that take scripture and we've put it to a tune. So it's a great way to learn verses in the Bible. So this verse is taken from Philippians 4.4. 4. See if you can guess it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Yes, rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, another scripture song that is found in Psalms 55. Maybe the choir knows that one. What's that one? I cast all my cares upon you. In fact, I think the choir knows all of these and they've sung them all. Okay, we can take stories in the Bible that are about different characters in the Bible, and we also put those to song. So let's hear that one. So this is based on a story. Many um, sons of Father Abraham. Father Abraham, you said it. Yes, it's a story about Father Abraham. Excellent. Okay, this one is a little bit of a harder one. Look to the, the bigger size, oversized children out there for some help. Has anybody given you a tip? Only a boy named David. 
Only a boy named David. We don't sing that as much, but I think your parents know that one. Now, the last group of songs that we're going to do is one of my favorite. It really tells us about God and who he is. And I think that God loves it when we sing about him. So let's see the next song. Amazing Grace? Well, that's a really good song, too. That's a great song. Let's see if you know. Um, yes, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus Loves Me. We sing that in all the Sabbath school classes. Yes, Jesus Loves Me. Okay, next one. He got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Yes, he does. Okay, last song and see if you can guess this one. God is so good. God is so good. That's a good one to end on because isn't that true? I want to sing that with you, boys and girls, this morning, and I'm going to ask all of you to join us in singing, God is so good. isn't he? Well, boys and girls, this morning, Pastor Joey is going to be talking to us about the Psalms. And the Psalms is a collection of songs. Just a minute, sweetheart. It's a collection of songs. Some of the songs are happy and joyful, and some of the songs make us sad and, and make us feel sorry. But it doesn't matter we can enjoy all of them. And so, boys and girls, this morning, I want you to take a song in your heart. And throughout the week, I want you to go ahead and sing it. No matter what you're feeling, I want you to take that song. Because I can promise you that even if you're having a bad day, it will make you feel better inside. Okay, boys and girls, you can go back to your seats now. Moms and dads... And members, I just wanted to let you know that tomorrow we start Vacation Bible School. As always, God has provided an amount of kids coming to participate in all the fun that we have planned. But God has also provided wonderful volunteers, adults, and junior high and high school kids. And we start tomorrow. So I ask that you just pray for us. Pray for the volunteers who are helping, but also pray for those children whose hearts are going to be impacted over the next week. Happy Sabbath. standing here with Scott Kidder and his grandfather, Pastor Martinez. Um, and it has been a privilege over the last several months to be able to get to know Scott uh, a little bit better, prepare him for uh, this momentous occasion um, today. Uh, we spent uh, a good amount of time just in study and in conversation, talking about both life and faith, core commitments to the gospel, the foundation of our faith and its message. Um, and his commitment to make this very public decision and declaration of his faith commitment 
um, to Christ uh, today. So it is an honor to be with him in the baptistry. I know that there are some family and friends of Scott that are here today. And at this time, I would ask if you would like to stand in support of his decision. And I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Martinez. Thank you. You may be seated. Scott, I would call you Poate, <laughs> because that's what we've been through the years. But for our friends and family, Scott, uh, today your mom, your dad, your sister, your immediate family and extended family, as well as friends in your church family rejoice. They rejoice because you have decided to publicly declare what you have done and lived privately, the fact that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your creator, as your redeemer, <laughs> and above all, as your friend. I can assure you, I can assure you that right now, the hosts of heaven are rejoicing, all the orchestras with their trombone, with their cellos and their bands with their trombones and the choirs are playing and singing their hearts out, rejoicing because you have decided to join in that journey that will propel us to that land made new where we will live forever with our Redeemer. I can assure you, in the meantime, that during the uncertainties, the concerns, and the fears of your immediate future, uh, your friend, Jesus Christ, will never abandon you or forsake you. And because all heaven and this church and your friends and your family are rejoicing with you in this decision that you've made, it is my pleasure to now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is indeed the day the Lord has made, and we are called to rejoice in it. And what a day of rejoicing it is as I stand here in this baptistry next to my very good friend, Gary Vestasian. Gary's been attending this church community for 20 years, and during the, those 20 years, he has been moved by the call of this community to live out the gospel. Now, Gary's come to this church Sabbath after Sabbath. He hasn't done it alone. He has done it accompanied by friends and family. At this moment, we would like you to rise and be acknowledged. Thank you. You may be seated. One thing you should know about Gary is Gary enjoys golf. And as a good golfer, he recognizes the necessity that one ought to have for mulligans. How amazing it is that the best mulligan that human beings can have is Christ Jesus. So Gary, because you have acknowledged the power that the gospel has to call us to live lives of striking obedience to Jesus, because you have recognized that in Jesus, the best mulligan, the best game, the best existence can be experienced and lived. It is now my pleasure and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is my friend Celia Lopez. 
Celia and I became acquainted when she started asking around, I want to be baptized. Who, who is here? Pastor Philip was not in town, and so I got to know Celia and her precious mother. And they've been studying with me, and we still have another study or two to go. But today was significant for Celia and her family. And so she's here. She attends, she's a junior at Grand Terrace High School, and yet she's very excited about going to Loma Linda Academy. And I say amen to that. She just heard word that they have accepted her, and she's just working out some of those obvious details. And we're hoping that she can enjoy a wonderful year, a junior year <clears throat> at Loma Linda Academy. And uh, I, asked, I asked Celia, why do you want to be baptized? And she said, I want to belong. I want to be a part of something, the family of God. She also enjoys this church. She enjoys worshiping here with you, and I love that. So I know that her family's here. She's very excited that her whole family's here, and lots of friends. I know that my son and my family, they know Celia, and so I want all the friends and family to stand right now in support of Celia. Amen. <laughs> you may be seated. Celia, because you love Jesus, and because you want to belong to the body of Christ and live for him, it gives me great joy to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Friends, perhaps you have been thinking about baptism. Come talk to any one of the elders or the pastors on this staff, and we would love to walk through that journey with you.
We really hope you're being blessed by the worship services so far. In just a few moments, Pastor Joey O, our pastor for administration and member integration, is going to be giving the very first sermon on this brand new sermon series on the book of Psalms, entitled More Than Words. Now before we go to the sermon, here's a few quotes. No single book of scripture, not even of the New Testament, has, perhaps, ever taken such hold on the heart of Christendom. The Psalms teach us about God and our relationship with Him. That is the heart of theology. The Psalter may be thought of as a portrait gallery of God, presenting us with multiple images of who God is. The more deeply we grow into the Psalms and the more often we pray them as our own, the more simple and rich will our prayer become. If you need a guide for your ongoing relationship with God, read Psalms. The Psalms are a little Bible wherein everything contained in the entire Bible is beautifully and briefly comprehended. The most valuable thing the Psalms do for me is to express the same delight in God which made David dance. Something to think about, now let's rejoin the service for Pastor Joey O's message on the book of Psalms. Please join us today as we read our scripture, Psalm 113, 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Today, we embark on a journey through the book of Psalms in a brand new series entitled More Than Words. For seven weeks, we will not only be reading the Psalms, we'll also be listening to the emotions of the psalmist. Now, can I be real honest with you? I have always had difficulty studying the Psalms. They were not something I enjoyed reading. I didn't always like the Psalms. I know that's kind of strange to hear that a pastor doesn't like one part of the Bible, but I, I struggled with it because I didn't really like the Psalms. You know, I feel like I've been here for a little while, been here a whole two months. We've gotten a little close. So can I share a secret with you? Here's my confession. My name is Joey and I'm a psalmophobic. <laughs> my least favorite part of the Bible was the Psalms. And here's why. I didn't always understand them. I didn't always understand the Psalms. They didn't seem to make logical sense. One moment the psalmist is happy, the next he's down in the depths of despair. One moment he's praising God, the next he is crying out in anger at God. So to me, they seem to be the ramblings of madmen. And yet, the Israelites, the people for whom the Psalms were originally written, held them in such high regard. And I didn't understand why until I realized what they were. The Psalms are the ramblings of madmen. <coughs> Men maddened by life people like you and I who have experienced life and experienced God in a world full of sin. And these people have placed their thoughts 
and their emotions onto paper. These are the raw prayers of real people. People who have struggled and succeeded. People who have laughed and lamented. And that's why they don't always make logical sense because the Psalms, the Psalms don't communicate logic. They convey emotion. The purpose of the Psalms was not to communicate logic to us. It is to express emotion. So often we have to approach the Psalms in a, in, with a different part of our brain than we do much of the, the rest of the Bible. See, much of the rest of the Bible is left-brained. The prophecies tax even the most adept scholars. The histories follow a common flow of thought. And the letters are filled with logic and reasoning. But the Psalms... The Psalms are different. The Psalms spark the right side of our brain. They don't challenge our logic as much as they inspire our emotions. So to fully understand the Psalms, we must listen for the emotions behind the words. How many of you have ever watched a movie before with the, so the sound completely turned off? Any of you done that before? If you haven't, you can try it sometime. Get a very scary movie, turn off all the sound, and watch it. It actually ends up being more funny than scary. Why? Because movies use music to convey emotions. So to fully experience a movie, you must hear the music. The Psalms are exactly the same. To fully experience the Psalms, we must hear the music. And that's why so many of the Psalms come with instructions of how they were to be performed, with music, with melodies, and, and instruments that have long since been forgotten. So while we can't literally hear the music that was intended to accompany the Psalms, we can figuratively hear that music. We can listen for the emotions that inspired those writers to write those melodies, and these words. See, to fully experience the Psalms, we must hear the music. We must listen for that music that lies behind the Psalms. So it's not enough to just study the words. We must also listen for the emotions that inspired those words. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take time to study, to do deep study on the Psalms. Because they were written in a different language and in a different culture than our own. So some amount of background study is necessary. But only so that we could fully understand the thoughts and the emotions that the psalmists were trying to convey. We must hear with our heads and our hearts. Because the psalms convey so much more than just words. They express emotions. And that's why listening to the Psalms is so beneficial to our relationship with God. As award-winning author Jim George, George so aptly put it, he said, if you need a guide for your ongoing relationship with God, read the Psalms. Read the Psalms. Because like any relationship, our relationship with God requires both knowledge and emotion. So you can't be in a relationship with someone if you don't actually know them. But you can't also be in a relationship with someone if you don't feel anything for them. It takes both knowledge and emotions to have a relationship. And that's why when we're asked to describe someone that we care deeply about, we don't just share the facts. We also express our feelings. When someone asks me about my wife, I don't just share the facts. I don't just say that she's the mother of two and a therapist and stunningly beautiful. You know, I don't just share the facts. I also share my feelings. When I'm around her, she makes me feel like I can do anything. She excites me. She has changed the way that I see the world. And yet when it comes to our relationship with God, Many times, we prioritize the facts over the feelings. 
We, we approach him more with our heads than our hearts. See, as a denomination, we've done a really good job at getting the knowledge, but not such a great job at times of expressing our emotions. And yet, when you read the Bible, when you look at the spiritual journeys of the people in the Bible, you see that they're full of emotions. <coughs> Anger, sadness, despair, elation, frustration. They are all there, and they're not afraid to express them, sometimes in very dramatic ways. They tear their clothes in sorrow. They lift their hands in praise. They dance in joy. And so for the next seven weeks, we're going to take the time to hear the music of the Psalms, to experience the raw emotions of real people. We're going to look at seven Psalms, seven songs, seven emotions that are a part of every relationship, but especially our relationship with God. And so as we approach these psalms, as we read these psalms, I want to encourage you to try what may be a new approach. Instead of using logic to try to squeeze as many answers out of these psalms as possible, take the time to listen to the psalms, to really enjoy them, to feel the emotions, hear the music. And the first psalm that we'll be looking at, that we'll be listening to, is Psalm 113. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to take them out, open them up to Psalm 113. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the seat pocket in front of you. In those pew Bibles, Psalm 113 is found in, on page 913. And we'll also have it on the screen so we can read together. Psalm 113, starting with verse 1, says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, this first sentence is translated from a single Hebrew word. And it's a very common Hebrew word, one that even if you've never read the Bible before, you probably have heard of. Actually, it's a word that's repeated over and over again in Handel's Messiah. Does anybody have a guess of what that word might be? I heard it over here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Which literally means praise Yah, which is this shortened version of God's personal name, the name he shares with his followers, Yahweh. So it's saying praise Yahweh. Praise be to Yahweh. Because this whole chapter, this whole psalm is all about praising the Lord. He continues. Verse 2. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its going down. The Lord's name is to be praised. From the rising of the sun to its going down. So this is speaking not only temporally, you know, from morning until evening, but also spatially, from where the sun rises in the east to where it sets in the west. May the name of the Lord be praised. So this psalm begins with a call for his people to worship. A call for everyone, everywhere, every day to praise the Lord. And then he continues. Verse 4. Sorry, I need to go back. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory above the heavens. This is really high praise, right? Pun intended. It's lofty stuff. Yeah, which begs the question, why, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to praise God? Have you ever wondered that? If you're a non-Christian and you're here today, you may have wondered that before. Why do Christians take so much time to praise God? Is it, is, is it a sacrifice of words to appease a mighty God? Why do we do it? Actually, praising God has a lot more to do with us than it does with him. See, praising God allows us to experience a key emotion, an emotion that is necessary to have longevity in relationships. So what is that emotion? What is that 
crucial emotion that we need to experience? Well, it's actually the emotion that's found throughout this psalm. But in order to catch it, you have to actually listen to the psalm and feel the emotion instead of just analyzing the words. So I'm going to read through the psalm one more time. And this time, don't analyze the words. Just listen to the psalm. And ask yourself this one question. What is the psalmist feeling? What is the psalmist feeling? All right? Verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seed him with the princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. So what is it? What is the emotion that this psalmist is feeling? I want you to turn to the person next to you. We're going to be very interactive this morning. Turn to the person next to you and share with them, what is this psalmist feeling? Go ahead. Thank you very much. So what is it? What emotion is he feeling? What did he hear? Joyful. Grateful. Hope. Adoration. Right? These are all different words for a similar emotion. One that I like to call appreciation. And here's the thing. Appreciation is crucial. Appreciation is is crucial for any relationship. Appreciation is crucial for all of our relationships, including our relationship with God. If we want our relationships to thrive, we need to learn to express our appreciation. Do you know why new love is so awesome? You know, when I was a youth pastor, a youth member came up to me and explained to me the difference between a crush and a boyfriend. Do you know the difference between a crush and a boyfriend? This is what she said. She said, a crush is exciting because it's new and you're blind to all of his faults. But a boyfriend, when he becomes your boyfriend, it turns into a drag. Her words, not mine. (laughs) Turns into a drag because then you see everything that's wrong with him. Now, as much as I respect her expertise in teenage romance, (laughs) I have to disagree. Because new love isn't amazing because it's blind. New love is amazing because it's unselfish. See, when you first enter into a relationship with someone, you see all of their flaws, you see their faults, but you overlook them Because your primary concern is showing them love. You are so filled with appreciation for them that you're willing to overlook some of their flaws. But that doesn't last, does it? As time goes, in every kind of relationship, as time passes, we start to lose that that sense of appreciation for the people that are in our lives we start feeling a sense of entitlement. We start feeling like we deserve those acts of service, that we have earned those romantic gestures. And eventually we start questioning our relationship with them. We start thinking, maybe he wasn't so great after all. Maybe she wasn't so amazing to begin with. Maybe I was blind, but now I see. See, but the problem, the problem isn't with our eyes. The problem is with our hearts. As Tom Cruise would sing, you've lost 
that love and feeling. <laughs> We've lost that crucial feeling, that crucial feeling of appreciation that gives relationships their longevity. We've lost that. So how do we reverse that process? How do we regain that sense of, of appreciation? It's very simple. We do as the psalmist did. We praise. We take the time to express our appreciation for each other. According to Amy Gordon, a psychologist at UC Berkeley, she says that the reason why the primary factor in the downfall of many relationships, our relationships with our parents, our relationships with our children, our relationships with our spouses, is because we neglect to express our appreciation. She writes this. She says, <coughs> sorry, one back. You get used to having your spouse in your life and forget why you chose to be with them. We get used to them, and we get entitled. So how do we reverse that process? Well, according to her, her article in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, she reveals how this works. She says, in our study, she took 50 committed couples, and then she gave them each uh, an appreciation journal to fill out during the course of a week. And after they filled out these journals, they discovered one key, one main discovery of this entire study, and it was this. Expressed appreciation inspires appreciation. Let me say that again. Expressed appreciation inspires appreciation. On days when partners would feel more appreciated, they would be more likely to express their appreciation to their significant other, who then would feel so appreciated, they would express that appreciation back. And it would create this cycle of appreciation that began just because one person was willing to say, thank you. Appreciation, expressed appreciation, creates appreciation. But it only works if you express it. If you just feel appreciative and don't share that appreciation, then it doesn't do anything. So we need to praise, we need to express it. See, that act of expressing, it not only inspires appreciation in others, but actually verbalizing that appreciation inspires it in ourselves. We start to realize how much we have to be grateful for. So we need to express that appreciation. Now, let me get real personal. See, I want all of us I want all of us in this room to have great marriages, to have great relationships with our parents, to have great relationships with our children, to have great relationships with our God. And this simple act of expressing our appreciation could be a breakthrough moment for us. So I want to challenge you to do as the psalmist said to, to everyone Everywhere, every day, express appreciation. Men, when you get in the car today, after you turn on the AC because it's hot, <laughs> reach over, take her hand, look deep in her eyes, swallow your pride, and say, thank you. And then fill in the blank with whatever comes into your mind. And I know, I know. If I were sitting where you're sitting and someone up here told me to do this, I'd be thinking what you're probably thinking, which is, well, I can't do that now. She'll know I only did that because you told me to do it. <laughs> so I'd probably wait like a, a month or so and say, you know, I had this completely original thought just came to my mind. <laughs> Let me give you a word of reassurance. If your wife has even average emotional intelligence, she will not respond to your thank you with, well, you only did that because he told you to. She won't. 
she'll be so, so grateful. Amen. And women. <laughs> Woo, that was a strong amen from the women. <laughs> women. Some of your husbands have been serving you and serving you and serving you. And at first you used to say thank you, but it's been a while. Maybe saying thank you doesn't really run in your family. You've really never heard your mom say it or your dad say it. So today I want to encourage you to do this, to express your appreciation. Take his hand. Look him deep in the eye and say thank you. And then fill in the blank with whatever comes into your mind. Kids, teenagers, you live in a culture that encourages you to be ridiculously entitled. And it's not your fault. You didn't create this culture. You were born into this culture. But you can also break that cycle of entitlement. You can do it. You can be that freaky teenager who actually appreciates his parents. Oh my goodness, right? <laughs> Strong amens from the parents this time. <laughs> Listen, your mom, your mom literally risked her life to bring you into this world. I know you don't get that now, but someday you will. Hopefully not anytime soon, but someday... <laughs> Someday you'll get it. Someday you'll say, oh my goodness, my mom did this to give me life. But until that day, would you swallow that sense of entitlement? Look your mom deep in the eye. Look your father deep in the eye and say, thank you. And then fill in the blank with whatever comes into your mind. And for us Christians in this room, those of us who know our loving God, a God that not only created us, not only died to rescue us, but every day watches out for us. If you know that God, if you purport to follow that God, then take the time to swallow that sense of entitlement that all of us struggle with. Look him deep in the eye and say thank you. And then fill in the blank with whatever comes into your mind. See, every day, relationships fall apart because we fail to do this one simple thing, to express our appreciation. So what would, imagine what our relationships could look like if we just took the time to say thank you, if we just took the time to do as the psalmist calls us to do, to everyone, everywhere, every day, express our appreciation. It would bring newness and freshness to our relationships. It would be like falling in love over and over again with the people that we care so deeply about. So be the one. Be the one that breaks that cycle of entitlement and starts a new cycle of appreciation today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to take the time to say thank you. Many times when we come to you in prayer, it's just full of, a, of requests for things we want you to do instead of taking the time to thank you for what you have already done. And so this morning, we come with our thanks. Thank you for being such a loving God. Thank you for being a God who cares so deeply about tiny little creatures who live here on this earth. Thank you so much for loving us so much that you did not Leave us in our own sin, but you came to rescue us from our sin. And we ask that you inspire appreciation in us for you and the gifts 
that you have put into our lives, the people that you have placed around us. Help us to express our appreciation today. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.